Oh my god, I look like a god dump truck. <laughs> oh my god. Finished the master's thesis after two years. And now I look like I've aged a hundred years and I look like I've taken uh, too many drugs. Wow, I need to get a little tan going on. Jesus Christ. <laughs> oh my God, sorry. I didn't want to start out the video like that, but I'm, I'm actually going to. Okay, so what have I been up to? You guys might find this to be interesting. I've got some notes because I want to stay on point here. So today I want to talk about everything I've been up to, specifically why this is relevant to you. We're going to talk about the French universal healthcare system. I was in the emergency room through that and I'll t break down specifically what the healthcare system was like, specifically for somebody who didn't have health insurance, believe it or not, you might think, well, it's a universal healthcare system. Well, there's a little caveat there. I'm gonna give you my objective take there. Next, because I'm in France, uh, which I'm going back to the US, which I'm very happy about, what it was like being here during the Russian invasion. I got to speak with Zelensky. That was a really cool experience. Next, got to talk to different White House officials about corruption during the intervention in Iraq and Afghanistan. I did that for my master's thesis. That was fascinating. Got to talk to different generals and stuff. I'll give you the behind the scenes idea about what they were exactly like as individuals. And then finally, I got to speak with Afghan Secret Service and special forces personnel as well. That was wild. A lot of them were unalived, unfortunately, before I could interview them. That was uh, quite insane. But anyway, I'll give you a whole background picture about that. So I'm not just ranting like another YouTuber, but there's actually a qualitative substance that you're going to be able to get through this video as I continue on making consistent videos. Normally I'm a facts and stats kind of person throwing out a lot of things about news and politics that isn't really covered in the news, but this one's just kind of gonna be more impromptu. Okay, first things first, universal healthcare system. So when I came to France, the theoretical idea obviously was, well, it's a universal healthcare system. So therefore, I am obviously going to get healthcare. Well, not necessarily. So here's the thing. I was on a student visa. I was getting my master's. I just finished it. I'm going to be going back to, to the US. I came to France because COVID closed all the different programs and I just wanted to come to France just to see what it was like. So alas, here we are. Okay. So the student visa would give you theoretically healthcare. However, it is reliant excuse me, it is reliant on whether or not France actually recognizes their student visa to allow you to get the healthcare. Now that sounds like ridiculous, specifically from an American standpoint where we might be thinking, no shit, that would be conducive towards giving you something like healthcare. If that's what's in their rules and you have it, why doesn't it, why doesn't two plus two equal four? Well, that's a thing. We don't really know why. And the significance is that if you are approved of a student visa, you have to take the visa and you have to give it to the French healthcare system and say, look, I have a visa. Therefore, you need to recognize it. But see, here's the thing. You need a specific form in order to do that. And if you don't have that specific form, if they just forgot to send it to you or just haven't gotten to it and it's still in processing, even though you're approved for the visa, you're never going to get this form. So then it runs into a lot of issues. I, as a result of that, even though it's a universal system, I did not have healthcare. And we could get, we can talk about all day about why this might be. There's also a potential fact that the French hate any sort of foreigners and they don't really want them to get universal healthcare as a result because they're worried that this might take away from their system, et cetera, et cetera. It's kind of a classic thing that you could probably just take a guess about what this entails and you're probably relatively right. Okay. So first things first, I was feeling like I was having a heart attack once upon a time. So back in 2020 during the pandemic, I had gotten the virus. Obviously we can't really say the virus because we are on, uh, this might be on YouTube or wherever. I got the virus, that sucked. I was misdiagnosed many times over, even though I had a healthcare in the US. I came to France, it kept getting worse. I had something called pericarditis. It is infection around your heart and your lungs. It is really bad, very uncomfortable. I'm going to save you the details. If you would like to look it up, you could please look it up. Uh, but essentially the moment you get high blood pressure, it feels like you're going to have a heart attack because not to botch the science, but, uh, <laughs> as I'm like stuttering, trying to like, think about how to simplify this, your heart doubles in size. I'm going to, I apologize to all the anatomy individuals out there or the people who are anatomically inclined. I'm going to botch this, but essentially your heart enlarges. There's a lot of inflammation around there. It's extremely painful and you could potentially die. Mine was not that severe, but it was bad. I had it for well over a year. I started the program back in 2021. So I had it about a year 
and it was very mild symptoms and it kept getting worse. During the master's degree, I had nine classes. Believe it or not, nine was over 30 credits. That's not a flex, it's not anything from an arrogant standpoint, none of us could do it. We just BS most of the classes and just focused on a handful and just try to make it work. They just thought that we should be able to handle it. But anyway, so it was about two o'clock at night. I had two Spaniard roommates. They said, you need to go to the emergency room. And I said, you're probably right. But here's the thing, I didn't have money for a taxi. That's gonna be expensive. So I decided to walk. There's no other way. There's something called a Metro, which is a train. Phenomenal system, amazing. But it closes, I believe at 12 o'clock at night. I could do an ambulance, but I don't have the money for that either. So I ended up walking about a half hour, to, hoping to baby Jesus that I don't end up unaliving on the process. So I get there. First thing I see is this, this poor innocent girl who was, uh, I'm gonna save you guys a lot of the details. She was essentially spitting up blood, her teeth are everywhere into garbage. I don't know what happened. It looked like she, I mean, if somebody laid in a road and got hit by a car, that's probably what it looked like. So I said, okay, you can go in front of me in line. We're sitting there in line. I don't really know what to expect because their healthcare is not as funded in the US, et cetera, et cetera. I'm trying to be as objective as possible. My bias is I'm for universal healthcare. So some of these things are going to pain me to say, but the infrastructure, not really impressive, not that great, very cluttered, very, uh, the maintenance wasn't great, but the treatment was phenomenal and it was fast. So I got there thinking I'm going to die. I tell them, hi, uh, my name is so-and-so. First I say like, parlez-vous uh, anglais? Like, do you speak English? And of course they're like, no, no English, no English. So I said, okay, great. So I said in, in French, and then they pretended like they didn't acknowledge my French because I didn't have the correct accent. So at this point I'm ready to like, I don't know if I can say this, well, actually I'm going to save myself from the cussing. I was going to hit a respective person as a result of this, I was so frustrated, but I'd probably unalive myself on accident doing that. So in advance, what we did was my Spanish roommates know French. So I recorded their voice saying, hi, my name is Luis. I'm speaking on behalf of Zach. This is what his problems are. So I give it to them and he has good accent and I knew that. So then I shoved the phone over, they listened to it and they begrudgingly shooed me forward. This was kind of more of the secretaries, the securities, these, all these individuals were giving me incredibly hard time because I am a foreigner and they don't like foreigners. So I sit down. The doctors though, they spoke English and they're all great. So I sit down, smells like vomit, everything's terrible. A lot, a lot, a lot of people, but people were coming in and out very quickly. So within 20 minutes, now normally in the US, I was in the emergency room many times throughout my life in the US, various injuries from different types of sporting things and, and uh, for the virus as well, I was there for that. And it uh, usually takes several hours. Everybody can probably vouch for me back in the States. It's kind of an average thought. It took me 20 minutes, got in, it was amazing. Got treatment very quickly. And I didn't know how much this was going to cost me because I didn't have healthcare. So what they do there is that you have a flat rate. So they pay for you to walk through the door in any additional x-rays and uh, whatever other tests they have. I would give you specifics, but I literally forgot the name of the test on the fly. <laughs> Just, I had like four different tests, blood work, x-rays, et cetera, et cetera, seeing what was wrong. After I got through all of that, they essentially, they put me back in the waiting room. I waited for another about 40 minutes and then I went in to take additional tests. They just wanted to make sure that I'm not going to unalive on the spot. So they had taken my blood, they checked my heart and all these other things in advance. And they said, okay, we know that you're not going to unalive right now on the spot. We're going to do further tests, but we have to wait for the rooms to clear. Okay, great. So I sat there about 40 minutes. It wasn't that bad. Got back in there, did all of the tests. They said, hey, you have pericarditis. We're going to put you on this treatment. Uh, you're going to get X amount. Essentially, I had to take 40 aspirin, it was four grams. 40, 40 aspirin every single day. And that was for three months. And then I had to, I had to, excuse me, it was 40 aspirin for about two weeks and I had to slowly wean down from it. I ended up taking this God awful amount of aspirin for about eight months or so, maybe a little bit longer. It was horrendous, uh, but they didn't, there's not really any other good way to go about it. So I'm, I'm taking with pericarditis, taking all these nine classes and all these other things, trying to make it through. Now the total bill, it was approximately $120 total without health insurance. $120. That's it. And it was technically in euros, but the euros equaled about a dollar at this point. So you get the point. Okay, great. That's insane. <laughs> That's it. 
So then from then on, you have every few months, I had a checkup appointment. The problem, the main issue I really have with their healthcare system is the fact that if you go to the doctor's office, you can't just go to say one doctor, get an x-ray right there on the spot in the same building. You have to set an appointment, meet with a doctor who gives you a prescription to get some sort of an x-ray, then you have to take the x-ray, go pay for another copay, which is probably about 20 euros, go to a different area, a different day, get the x-ray, then take the x-ray, create another appointment to go back to the same guy or girl or whoever to uh, get them to analyze that and give a prescription. Then you have to take the prescription, then you have to go to a pharmacy, which is located in usually a different area, it's it, pharmacies are pretty much on every block literally and so you just go there then you have to give them you know pay them then get the drugs and then that's that so it was a whole it's a whole process that was a pain but no one's going bankrupt here for that and i think that that was very special and i think that that's something that we could very well learn from in the states and for those who might be thinking well how do exactly would we get the money to be able to do these things listen i don't even want to hear it the u.s military budget is at over 800 billion dollars every single year okay some things like a driving pin which costs i think last time i checked it was approximately about 15 dollars a little driving pin that cost approximately two thousand four hundred dollars in the u.s military because of things called no big contracts driving pins by the way are things that are located within rifles if i remember this correctly uh based on own personal experiences so I don't really want to hear it. And after learning and doing a thesis on corruption in it during the U.S. intervention, I also don't want to hear it. And given the fact that we are giving so much money to other countries, whether it be Ukraine, which I'm not going to make a political statement on that just yet, I, but just the amount of money, even though there's been many instances of corruption, specifically $300 million, or we have the other instances, the billions of dollars that are going to Israel. And I don't want to hear any excuses about the Iron Dome because that's $500 million. You get the point. So why can't we have this? Why can't we have this? That's my point with this section. Okay, moving on. Russian invasion. Obviously, being here, one of the first interesting aspects about the invasion was that everybody, all these different uh, Europeans from different countries had all resoundingly agreed. Oh, God damn. <laughs> we are not ready for this. We being Americans, we were ready for this because obviously that's what half of our society dreams about. <laughs> you know, Red Dead Red Redemption type stuff. But they're not ready for this in any capacity. As a matter of fact, I was speaking to one of these German security specialists. So my background is I study security policy. So it's like political science is a blanket and I study security policy. So the one European uh, individual, he was German, we were talking at a bar one day. He'd specialized in security and he had said, yeah, I don't think the Americans really have a good idea about the extent to which corruption had plagued a lot of European militaries. And I said, what specifically are you referring to? And he said, well, here's the thing. Let's take a attack helicopter. And I was like, okay, that's a very weird metric. You know, some people measure their military success in different ways, but sure, let's just use a attack helicopter as a, as a reference. And he said, no, you don't understand. Statistically, we have zero attack helicopters because corruption had plagued our system. We have absolutely nothing. So then we're, I, I was thinking, okay, what does this equal? What does this mean? He said, well, all European nations are likely going to increase their military budgets probably by double as a result of this. Now, granted, that's, that's the equivalent of jumping up to like 4% of their GDP, whereas the US, it's roughly about 50%, a little over 50%, about, I think it's about, yeah, about 50, 60% last I checked, ballpark, and about half of that military budget goes to private contracting companies, fun fact. I'll get into that in a different video. And so he said, well, we have to understand the fact that if all European, uh, security forces combined cannot stop a theoretical Russian invasion. Now we have the idea of nukes and things like that. We really don't know how that's going to play out. You have tactical nukes. Would we engage in some sort of nuclear operations if Russia's already through the borders of say like Norway by example? These are all different questions that nobody really has answers to. We had individuals speak with us from the French uh, Ministry of Defense. We had all these different security personnel coming in and having conversations with us about these very exact things. Now, one thing that I, I do think it is important for me to tell Americans out there, and I cannot say the name of the person, I think I will get in trouble for this, but one NATO security personnel who is European had stated very specifically that Europe is trying to eventually wean themselves off of the US 
and have their own European NATO and kick the United States out. Now, do I blame them for this because of the fact that a lot of these European countries have different conceptions about what they want to do with Ukraine? No, I don't blame anybody. I don't blame anybody. I think the United States needs to focus on improving our infrastructure and reducing the violence and the poverty and the drugs and everything back in the states. Okay, we don't need to be dealing with all of these different countries. Why doesn't Europe just deal with their own affairs a little bit more than the US is dealing with their affairs for them? Okay, you see my, my political stance with that. But this was a good point. And I thought, well, that's interesting. When are they planning to do this? And this official had said within the decade. So what I'm trying to say is even though I cannot tell you the specific person, Keep that in the back of your mind. Just keep that in mind. Okay, now let's go into speaking with Zelensky. <clears throat> By the way, if I keep like coughing on the side, it's literally from uh, the uh, virus. I'm still not 100% over that. So meeting with Zelensky, he went on this entire tour, meeting with different uh, students for the Ukrainian cause, and he was doing this through Zoom. Now, the first group of students that he had met with the world, in the world, were, were us. I don't know how France pulled some political connections to make it happen, but it was cool. If I have footage, like I have like little quick videos of just a few of us chatting with him, I'll put it on the screen right now, but you get the idea. It was cool to meet him. It was funny behind the scenes before the cameras had actually started rolling and everything else. He was, uh, <laughs> he was focused on how his arms looked, the depth of his arms on camera. So he would kind of like, he would, uh, he would posture his arms and like look at his arms and then he'd look through the camera and then he would like flex for a second and then he would kind of like bring his shoulders back and like turn his arms. So he was doing this for about five minutes. Look, I don't blame the guy. It was just a funny thing. It was like, oh, look at that. You're human too. You're trying to put up this masculine front. I don't blame you. I'd probably do the same thing, but that was funny as hell because it's like, hey man, we can see, <laughs> we can see you. Like we, we're watching you this whole time. But anyway, that was a good experience. There wasn't anything I could really take away from it that you guys don't already know. A lot of it was just dehumanizing the Russians and so on. Again, I don't really blame them, but it was a lot of their animals. I don't really know some of the allegations that he had made if they were correct, so I'm hesitant to say, but one thing I will say is he was saying that there are multiple instances where Russian soldiers would allegedly take babies and I don't know if I can say the R-A-P-E, I don't know if I'm gonna get censored for that or not. These babies assault them in front of their, their parents and then would unalive the parents after unaliving the baby, things like that. So he would go in a lot of different stories like that. They could be true, they could be not. There's not really any way to, to prove it, frankly, and that's why I'm hesitant to talk more about it. But it was a very good experience. He was a very stoic, serious guy. He actually asked us questions about what we would recommend to do to reach out to the youth and how to platform himself, like how we would recommend he, he approach these types of uh, conversations with the younger generations. And he would, he would actually have a back and forth with us about that. And that was an interesting tactic. That's a lot of, uh, a lot of these different world leaders that I've seen have a similar tactic in the European, uh, Western Europe, but also especially in Eastern Europe a lot of the individuals will have back and forth conversations a lot more frankly than we see in the States. So that was a cool, it was a cool experience, interesting guy. I'll, I will likely, if I know I'm not gonna get trouble, I'll give you more details about what this, uh, how I got into this meeting, got accepted for it and so on and so forth. I would say the more fascinating feature of Zelensky and what he was saying was more of just his demeanor Obviously, he's a very stone cold and stoic individual, but man, this dude was vicious. <laughs> a lot of times when we see him on camera, he's very uh, regimented and very focused, but he, the intensity in his eyes was something to behold. But anyway, I, there's not a lot to that converse, that part of the, of that, there's not a lot to that aspect of the Russian invasion. It, it was a cool experience. I'm not gonna use this as some clickbait because I'm not talking about it a lot, but you get the idea. I just wanted to mention that this was something that had happened. This is something that he's attempting to do. And it was a cool experience for a lot of the younger folks. Does it change my opinion about Ukraine and Russia and things like that? No, it doesn't. <clears throat> it doesn't change anything, but it was great. Okay, now the White House officials. So essentially I was studying corruption and oversight. So what oversight committees exist to reduce the amount of corruption and waste that we see during the US wars in Iraq and Afghanistan? Now, as a result of uh, prior kind of work experience that I'd had working in media, different political campaigns and so on, and with uh, 
my background in Twitter and things like that and growing the social media, I'd reached out to somewhere in the ballpark of like 200 individuals seeing if they would want to be interviewed for my thesis. These are individuals I'd specifically looked for generals and White House officials, people for the National Security Council who are in charge of writing policy, people who worked for the State Department, the senior levels, all these individuals who might know a thing or two about corruption, as well as this group called the Special Inspector General for Iraq Reconstruction, SIGAR, I'd spoken with those individuals as well, and the directors for the Government Accountability Office, that's the office that oversees all corruption and waste for the US government. So I'd spoken with all these different individuals and had paired it with several hundred different interviews, like transcripts of different people uh, who were in charge of the war process. Transcripts that were released online, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I'm gonna be honest with you, they were actually a lot nicer than I thought. Now, not to say they were good people, I'm not gonna go that far. Some of them were, some of them were genuine, very genuine people, and they, they spoke very frankly. And I'm going to watch my words, what I say now, because I had a contractual deal with my school and with them to state that I wouldn't provide specific quotes and I wouldn't paraphrase and attribute different statements to specific individuals uh, outside of the thesis itself. I'm trying to get the thesis published, but then there's like a, a contractual issue with the school and I figure out if I'm allowed to do that. But that was the caveat in order for these individuals to be willing to speak with me. They would speak very openly with me if under the condition that it's very limited to this, this type of work and in return, I would give them this uh, thesis once I'm done about corruption intervention, what I found, what US officials could learn from this type of thing. And I will make all different videos going into details about these things. I'm going to speak specifically about what it was like with these people behind the scenes. The specific details, what they revealed, what can I say more vaguely, what can I give you documents to affirming specific statements, all these types of things I'm going to do in a different video because I don't want to make this a hundred minutes long and it's not really the time and place, frankly. So these people were smart, very smart. They weren't the smartest for sure. They were nice, very serious individuals. Some of them were more focused on controlling the narrative, and that's what I found to be very interesting. Now, these might come across as no shit things, like, Zach, why are you even talking about this? You're wasting everybody's time because these are, are very vague statements. Obviously, this is going to be the case. Well, it might seem to be the case to you, but it's actually not necessarily always the case. It's fascinating. A lot of times, these guys who spoke very frankly but what's cool about these inner cool air quote cool about these conversations was what specifically they would take accept fault for and what specifically would they blame on other people and mostly they would accept the fact that corruption happened under their watch that was a big deal they said yeah 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 that happened i said why did that happen they said well because we didn't prioritize it corruption why didn't you prioritize it well because we we're focused on maintaining security relationships with individuals in the afghan and the iraq government and I'd said, well, wait a second, if people on the ground hate corruption and waste, or spe specifically people like, let's say Afghanistan, if people in Afghanistan hate corruption and these warlords use the money they're paid from the US to commit these atrocities, how did you not possibly think to overlook corruption if that's what's radicalizing individuals to join, say, the Taliban? And they said, look, we were under a timeline that was completely unrealistic. The Bush administration had created a timeline for when we're supposed to withdraw. He gave us a stack of cash. He said, you need to spend it because spending equals progress. If we don't spend it, then we are viewed as failing as a department. So we have to throw the money out there, say the money is spent, and then we have to get ready to withdraw. That created programs that were way too large for us to manage, us to be reliant on people in these countries that we shouldn't be relying on because we don't have the physical personnel in the country. And as a result of that, we can't look over these individuals all the time. And I said, well, doesn't that seem like a really, excuse my language, but doesn't that seem like a really stupid idea? <laughs> I don't know why I said excuse my language. I thought I was gonna say something worse, but I caught myself. I'm getting used to this media thing again. And they said, yeah, yeah, we definitely thought that that was not going to work to an extent. But they said, we didn't actually think it was not going to work uh, for a few years down the line. It was about 2006, 2007, that some military personnel found out, about 2007. But then people who were in charge of like aid and giving like humanitarian aid assistance, this was in Afghanistan, excuse me, 
all the way back to about 2002, 2003, they said, yeah, we knew this right off the bat. We literally give people money and then they just spent it. And any sort of anti-corruption efforts were stifled by this thought that these people who are corrupt could still maintain security over the Taliban. And you might be thinking, well, aren't they just pissing off locals and having them join the Taliban? Yes. Did anybody think of that? No. Does that sound ridiculous? Yes. Is it the truth still? That's also yes. And so the people that I'd spoken with, what was interesting was they were okay with accepting these different types of things because it was already known. We already know this. But what was interesting was that they would refute one specific fact about this situation, which was they had poor coordination with other agencies. And as a result of that, this coordination, they became over-reliant on these warlords when they themselves as individuals should not have been doing that. And that might sound very specific, very niche, very weird, but for some reason they were all very touchy about that. And the reason is because one of the biggest issues that had led to the reliance on these different warlords was literally the fact that they didn't, they, there was a security, there, uh, excuse me, there was a, a lack of staff that was an issue. But a big issue with all, in all of this as well was just the fact that like agencies like Department of State just sucked at coordinating with the, the military. And because that should be a theoretical issue that should be easily like uh, dealt with. So t it sounds like a tedious thing, but like relatively simple to fix. They really didn't want to accept any accountability because that's one thing that you could point to and be like, hey man, instead of paying a warlord to maintain security while you build this house, why didn't you just do a better job at coordinating with the military when they get into that region and then just have them take security while you build that house so you don't rely on the warlord? And that's what's very sensitive to them. So interagency coordination is what that's called. Now, if you want to know what specifically is going to happen in places like Ukraine, if there's a reconstruction there or any of these other places, interagency coordination is going to be the number one American failure that's going to lead to a bunch of money wasted that we could have used for social welfare. Quote me on that. But anyway, most of these guys were pretty talk, pretty frankly, honestly, they really didn't care at this point what anybody thought except for that interagency coordination aspect. I, the military guys were obviously a lot more blunt. The guys who were in charge of developing uh, war policy for Iraq and Afghanistan, I give you more details, but I have to speak with uh, different like lawyers and so on and see what I can reveal. The Department of State guys were pretty cool as well. Everybody seemed to be relatively all right with speaking with me. And I think most of the reason is because there were at times where they're trying to control the narrative, specifically as it relates to what their role was. So for example, we didn't do that. I myself didn't do that. That was sweet baby Jesus. The camera just cut out. <laughs> A lot of these folks though would say, we didn't do that. That was not our job. That was, uh, that was Dick Cheney. Dick Cheney's the one that made that policy. And that happened all the time, by the way, and that's probably relatively correct, but there are times where I would have to call them out and say, well, no, according to the documents, this was your specific job in, say, for example, the Department of State. You can't blame this on somebody else. But overall, people were very keen on blaming Cheney for everything. Essentially, within like the White House, by example, there was a, a general consensus that there was Bush and Cheney who did their own thing, and then you had all the other individuals in the administration who had all focused on developing plans. So a lot of times these folks would develop plans, develop a specific idea about what exactly we should be doing. And then Bush and Cheney would ask very vague questions. Do you need help? Is everything going okay? And they would not accept no for an answer or else they would get mad and maybe fire some people. But if you said everything is going okay, they wouldn't ask any additional questions. And I learned that inside the, the White House, they would do that intentionally. And the reason why they would do that is so they could limit their culpability. They could limit the amount that uh, the public could blame them because they could always fall back on, well, I didn't know that was the case. My administration didn't, they didn't tell me. And so that was something that was very significant to the Bush administration where they knew what to ask, what not to, because they knew things were going bad. But at the same time, they didn't want to be held to blame. That's very interesting. Oh, and by the way, Dick Cheney is exactly how you think. He's an absolute psychopath and everybody inside the administration acknowledged that as well. Now, finally, we have the Afghan security personnel. I might actually get some uh, audio recordings if I can, or maybe get some statements from some of them. I'd actually known some people from MSNBC, CNN, 
NBC, there's like a, a specific correspond, well, a few correspondents who worked for them in Afghanistan. He was kind of a contractor. And I'd reach out to him and he had gotten me in contact with these different officials, these different uh, special forces personnel who end up becoming secret service. And then we have to verify their I identity. And we do that through different like pictures and you have to triangulate who they are and get some alibis, et cetera, et cetera. So we ended up doing this, it was a really cool project. Some of these guys, man, it's fascinating because I didn't know what exactly I would walk in on with some of these uh, special forces personnel, et cetera. It turns out like a lot of them, they were actually educated in the UK with a master's degree, which I was like, whoa, there's a master's degree individual who's also a special forces become secret service for the Afghanistan government. That's okay. First of all, that's a fascinating, that's a fascinating discovery. Like, <laughs> like what? And half the time I'm sitting there on the phone, like I can't, I can't even believe that this is like a reality right now. And uh, a lot of them couldn't get out, obviously, during the Afghanistan invade or the, the withdrawal, the U.S. withdrawal. They couldn't get out of the, the country. So a lot of them were stranded. We were speaking on different media platforms like WhatsApp and they would change their identity oftentimes. But yet they I would still stay in contact with them. They a lot of them obviously had worked in some way, shape or form with the CIA. A lot of them I would speak with when hear back for a while, receive a message from one of the other individuals saying, yeah, that person was killed. Here's his photo, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, a lot of them were in prison for a while, somehow released because one guard was cool with them and then would release them. Some of them were held prisoner and were forced to train the Taliban to use different U.S. weapons you know, or else their family would be all mass unalived. So it was very, it was a lot of that. And I'm going to go into that a lot more in depth and provide a lot more uh, videos, like probably do a video series on this. So I want to give like a general idea about what this was like, kind of like a preface, preface, preface. I'm going to do like a little, little heads up that that's something I'm going to be doing. I want to do the justice on that though. So I want to kind of focus a lot more time and attention, but those people were very cool. Spoken with a lot of civilians in Iraq and Afghanistan as well. I, uh, I also spoke with a lot of oil executives in Iraq and so on. That was amazing to speak with them. Some prisoners of war as well. I will see if they want to want me to release some statements. That was a really cool experience though. Everybody was very nice, very cool, very chill. No, everybody was very honest. I was very surprised. All the politicians, civilians, everybody was extremely honest. The only thing they said was, can you validate our security? Can you make sure that we're not going to be unalived as a result? And so I had to meet with like specialists in these areas and now, okay, how do we make sure that I can verify their identity, uh, but also ensure that their security is, is good to go. I don't know why they were willing to speak with me, frankly. I think it might be because of my, my like social media pre pre uh, prevalence. No, that's not the word. Presence where they can actually read back and see like what I've ever posted, who I am, this, the, the work, etc. So a lot of people always talk about like social media being a bad thing, but that's actually a really important thing because if you actually are very careful with what you say and very intentional with what you say, which we're all going to make mistakes, but generally speaking, then people can actually track who you are as an individual and then judge whether they want to speak with you as a result of that. So that was really cool. That was a cool experience and that was very gratifying and the, Afghan locals, man, I, I'd say they're some of the coolest people I've ever met in my entire life. They're always at, they always start with like, how are you? Before you get to any business, they're asking like, how are you? How are you doing? These types of things. Not in a, it's so much like an American sense where we just say it kind of reflexively, but they take the time to actually acknowledge kind of where you're at and how you feel first. It was a really cool experience, but those guys were fascinating and I'm still in contact with some of them. Some of them are still alive. There's the, they're telling me that there's a rise of ISIS on the ground there. And a lot of the formerly trained U.S. personnel uh, are joining ISIS, similar to in Iraq, where a lot of those people joined ISIS, the people not U.S. trained, but the people that the U.S. fought who were part of Saddam's regime ended up joining ISIS. But in Iraq, or excuse me, Afghanistan, it's people that were trained by the U.S. are now joining ISIS. So in both cases, U.S. policy led to the increase in ISIS. And you might be thinking, that sounds ridiculous, Zach. Afghanistan and Iraq are not near each other. Afghanistan is not even near Syria. Yes, you're right. But it's still a thing. You know, people can, in fact, travel. And it's a big deal right now. They're paying a lot of money. And I asked this guy, 
why would anybody join ISIS? And they said, well, because the Taliban's not going to stop unaliving our family, and so that's what we're doing. Now, I haven't spoken with anybody who's willing to join ISIS, but they know people who have joined ISIS, and that's the idea. They said, well, ISIS is terrible, but at least they're not going to unalive my family. It's like, yeah, man, I, I guess, but they're going to do all the, you know, videos that we see online. But their argument is, well, the Taliban already does that to us anyway. So that's intense, very intense situation. But anyway, I'll go into all of this in other video, video series, etc., etc. So I'm going to provide more detail. This is just a general idea about what I've been up to. So it's been a wild ride. Going back to the US, very excited about that. I have some ideas about what I'm going to be doing. Well, I have plans, specific plans, what I'm doing when I get back to the US as well. I really want to come back and make progress on the ground with all y'all. But uh, yeah, wild times.